to tell you that sometimes. And I don't know about you guys, but all of my kids and the kids that I've been in, uh, in my lineage are Y kids. Anybody been a Y kid or know a Y kid? All of my kids are Y kids. You tell them something or you ask them to do something, they why? My daughter Jessie was the biggest Y kid of all. Like I couldn't stand to watch movies with her or show, why is the Little Mermaid's hair red? Why didn't Bambi's mother die? Why, 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 constantly? And those kids are hard. I mean, Jessie's, I can tell you, one of her teachers really struggled with Jessie because she would say, two plus two equals four, and Jessie would go, why? <laughs> and that drove that teacher nuts. And that drove me nuts a little bit. I, and I remember conversations like this. This is why they're hard to parent. I would say, go, this happens with my grandkids too. Go brush your teeth, it's time for bed. Why? So that your teeth don't rot out of your head. Why? So you can eat candy and cookies. Oh, that's a good one. Well, why do I have to go to bed? Because it's 9 o'clock and you're 5. <laughs> why? And you want to say, because I'm tired of answering your questions. <laughs> and you know what you do say? Because I said so. <laughs> right? How many of you have ever said that? And all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, I am my mom. <laughs> right? Am I right? But all of us, if somebody said to us when we were kids, and they probably did, because I said so, <clears throat> that's a dumb reason. We hate to be told you have to do this because I said so. We want to think it through and we want to make our own decision, right? And we want to weigh that decision and say, well, you know, what is this going to cost me? Is this practical? Does it make sense to me? What's in it for me? Before we do something, right? We don't want to have to do something just because someone said so. It kind of makes us mad because we want to be in control. We want to make our own decisions. Even little kids feel that. We've been talking about walking with Jesus and being in a relationship with Jesus. And so far, if you've been paying attention, and if not, I'll catch you up right now, we've noticed that Jesus initiates contact. He initiates uh, some kind of an encounter. He either comes where people are, the world became flesh and dwelt among us, or he starts a conversation or something. He does something to initiate some, uh, um, an encounter, and then he makes some kind of an instruction. Uh, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. Crippled man, uh, pick up your mat. Fisherman, follow me. And then he offers some kind of a result that's going to happen. Zacchaeus, come down from the tree, and I'm going to go to your house and build a relationship with you in your own world. A uh, person that has been crippled for 38 years, pick up your mat and walk. That's a big one, right? Fishermen, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm going to make you more than what you already are. He makes some sort of a promise or some sort of a future prediction. And in that, though, Jesus respects or requires a response. He gives an instruction, and then the people have to follow his instruction in order for that to happen. Do you know what that means? That means that we have to obey Jesus in order to walk with him. Ooh, we hate that word, obey, don't we? But that's the thing. If we're going to walk with Jesus, it means doing things Jesus' way just because he said so. Mm, that's hard for us. Today we're going to read that same story that we read last week, only we're going to read a different version of it. Last week we read about the calling of the fishermen from Mark's version, which is exactly like Matthew's version. Today we're going to read Luke's version, and Luke, it's not a different story, it's the same story, but Luke gives us a little bit more details. And that doesn't mean the stories contradict. Uh, you know, if you think about the story, it was Simon, Andrew, James, and John. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not there. They had to have heard the story from someone else. I think Luke, the physician, just heard more details or wanted to give more details. So we're going to read Luke's more detailed version and see if we can learn something by what happens uh, in, this, in these deeper details. So this is Luke. And we're in chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Hear these words. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. 
he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked to, for him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, as we un try to understand this passage this morning, we ask that you would speak to our hearts and minds, that you would help us to listen, hear, process, and respond. We just surrender this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a really interesting story, and I want us to pay attention uh, to some things that are happening here. That Jesus, first thing that happens is, and it actually begins pretty well for Simon. Uh, this is Simon Peter. Jesus na names him Peter later. That's who we're talking about here. So, so Jesus is talking to some people, and he sees that these guys are cleaning their nets and their boats are sitting there. And so Jesus takes it upon himself to get into one of the boats, and then he asks Peter, can you put out just a little ways from shore uh, so I can speak to the people? And what, that, what he's doing there is he's, he's using the water as a microphone. If you, I, I don't, my, my brain doesn't understand this, but for some reason, sound carries better over water. And so if he goes out, there's a lot of people around him. If he goes out off the shore just a little bit and speaks, then people on the shore can hear him a lot better. That was practical application of, of nature right there. And so Jesus asks Peter, would you put out? And, G and Peter says, yeah, no problem. He does it right away. And I think that's really interesting because most of us are like that when God calls us and asks us for something. Oh, sure, in my comfort zone, just a little bit, you know, not into deep water, nothing, that, nothing stressful. Oh, sure, I'd be glad to do that because for Peter, if you think about it, he takes Jesus out. There's this whole crowd hanging around, and, and, uh, and Simon Peter gets to be with the rock star, right? He gets to take the selfie with the rock star. I got Jesus right here. Yeah, I'm helping him. He needed my help, so I'm helping him. He came to my boat, or he came to my house, or he came to my church. We love that, right? That reflects really well on Peter. Yeah, I'm with the rock star. Yeah, I was just with Jesus. No big deal. No big deal, right? So it looks good on us. And so we like that. Look at me. I'm with Jesus. Doesn't cost me anything. Right where I'm comfortable, no problem. And then Jesus takes, finishes his little conversation with the people, and he does something different. The first time he asked Peter, hey, would you do this? The second time he says, okay, go into deeper water and put down your nets. See, now he's not asking. Now he's telling. See, Jesus initiated something with Peter. He started a conversation, started an activity with Peter in Peter's comfort zone, and now comes the instruction. And Peter has to respond. Simon Peter has to respond. And it's interesting how Simon responds. I like it. He says, um, we've been working all night, and we haven't caught a thing. We're cleaning our nets. We're done. We're ready to put away, pack up for the day. We didn't catch anything. He's objecting a little bit to Jesus. And here's the thing. I love this. We're allowed to do that. We're allowed to do that. We're allowed to object and to say, look, I've already tried this. I've done all I can. And he lets us go and look at Moses and David in the Old Testament. They were constantly arguing with God. Moses kind of tried to correct God. God will let you do that. He will let you discuss. And so that's what Peter does. He says, I've already done that. But also in the midst of that, let's recognize what Peter is saying in this and what he's doing. Peter is expressing the human condition. I've done all I can, and it wasn't enough. And I failed. I came up short. I've put everything I had. I've used all my expertise. And I can't get any further. So I don't want to try to go any further. 
I'm ready to give up and take a break. Is that not the human condition? We can try, we can do over and over again, and, some, and something is still missing. Something is still not right. We still feel like we're not enough. That's why people do so much plastic surgery and all the things. It's, we're just not quite enough. There's something more I have to have. And so he's expressing the human problem. But it, for us, my friends, when we get to that human problem where Jesus says, hey, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go beyond your comfort zone. Let's go in timing that isn't convenient for you. Let's go where you've already tried and failed. And this is what we do a lot of times. That's when we become those why people. And we're like, what's in it for me, God? What's this going to cost me? How uncomfortable am I going to be? Is this practical? Can I even do it? And Peter's kind of saying, I've already tried. I can't do it. And by the way, Peter's tell, or Simon is telling that to J Jesus, who is not a fisherman. I'm a fisherman, and I've been fishing all night, and I haven't caught a thing. It's kind of what he's saying. But we ask those questions of God, and we, when God calls us into deeper water, we start rationalizing, and we essentially do the same thing that Simon says. We go, I can't do it. It's not, it's not good for me. And so we then will make our own decision. And many times that decision is, well, I'm not going to do that. It's too expensive for me. Or I'm not comfortable with that. Or that's not what I'm good at. Or I've already tried that and it didn't work. Oh my gosh, how many times do we say that in a church? I already tried that and it didn't work. But I want us to recognize something. If Jesus calls us to do something and we take that call and that instruction and we process it against our own desires and our own timing and rationalize and what's going to be in it for us and we decide to go our own way, even if we go and do it, we go our own way because we've made the decision. We are not obeying Jesus and walking with Jesus. We are using Jesus as an advisor. We are saying, you, Jesus, walk with me, and I will consult with you as I need, and then I'll make the final decision. Who's the Lord in that situation? Jesus does not call us to be in an advisory position with him. He doesn't want to just be our advisor. He wants to be our Lord and Savior, and that requires obedience. That requires doing things Jesus says just because he said so. And that's what Simon Peter does in the midst of this conversation. He objects and he, he says, nah, it's not a good idea. I already tried this. But just because you said so, I will do it. Wow, that goes against his human nature, really, if you think about it. That tells you something about the magnetism of Jesus. We've seen it already. Something made him say, okay, I'll do it just because you said so. And so he steps out in faith, or he moves out in faith. He goes into deep water. He puts down his net, and look at what happens. Overwhelming catch of fish. So many fish that then he had to call his friends and his partners and bring their boat too, and both of those boats almost sank because of the overwhelming catch of fish. And that is the fruitfulness that Jesus talks about in John 15. He says, you know, if you stay with me, if you stick with me, abide with me, remain in me, depending on the translation you read, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, Jesus in this is teaching Simon and all of us something about himself, ourselves, but especially about the nature of God. God has control over nature, first of all. I can jump those fish into your boat if you want me to. I got that kind of control. I can give you the biggest catch ever. But also, God can do something with you and with me and with, with Simon that we can't do on our own. When we feel inadequate, when we feel like I've already tried and I failed, and then God comes along, all of a sudden failure is not an option. God doesn't fail. God's, God provides. God does. God blesses. And it's abundant. What Jesus is showing us here is the contrast between life on our own, no fish, and life with Jesus, more fish, more blessing than we can even handle, beyond our imaginations. And I want you to pay attention to the blessing and how, who that blessing was for. Who got that fish? Simon Peter. That fish was for him. 
It was for him to feed his family. Jesus didn't say, hey, take all this fish and go give it to the world and you don't get to have any of it. That was for him to feed his family or to sell in his business to provide for his family. And the really cool thing is not only did Simon receive this overwhelming blessing, that overwhelming blessing poured out on his friends and his partners. That's what God will do in your life if you do what he says just because he said so. On the other side of obedience, there is overwhelming blessing. And that does not mean you're going to be rich. God says, I know the plans I have for you, Jeremiah 29, 11. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. He wants to prosper you, but that doesn't mean you're going to be rich. There's a difference between prosperity and wealth. Prosperity is about peace and joy and contentment and knowing that I have what I need and you will not be in want, the good shepherd says. If he's your shepherd, you will not want for anything. You will have what you need beyond your imagination. That's what he's showing us here. I can tell you I've experienced that in my own life. I have pictures on my wall in my office that some of you may have noticed that if I'm facing them when I'm sitting at my desk and it's two pictures of my family and me at Young Life Camp. See, uh, about, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago, I was working, I felt called by God to go into youth ministry and I said, okay, I'll stay right here in shallow water. I'm going to stay right here at this church where I'm comfortable, where I've already been serving and I'll, be, I'll go on staff. Yeah, sure, I'll be the youth pastor or assistant youth pastor or something there. No problem. And God said, nope, I want you to leave that church, and I want you to go out into deep water, into pla- somewhere you haven't been. And I didn't want to do it. I fought against it, but ultimately, you know, God doesn't take no for an answer, I'll tell you that, so you might as well just not fight. I went, and I ended up working at Kellum Young Life, do, volunteering and opening my house for like 100 kids from Kellum Young Life. And I, will te- and I ended up coming to Sandbridge, too, so that the rest is history there. But I can tell you, that experience of working with Young Life that I didn't even know existed prior to that, Young Life is an outreach ministry to high school kids. My family, I was blessed in a way that I never, ever would have imagined. And those pictures on my wall show my whole family acting goofy and having fun in ministry together. The depth of the discipleship that grew in me, but beyond me, in my husband and in my kids. And God started using them in ministry and using them in leader as leaders and using their friends. It blows my mind when I think back on it. And I don't even, I'm not even talking about the lives that they touched. I'm talking about how Jesus touched our lives and the joy and the fun. Oh my gosh, go to work every day, jumping off a rose course, is hanging out with teenagers at my young life camp. Sign me up. What a blessing. But it came through obedience. On the other side of obedience, there is blessing beyond measure. There is God using you uh, beyond measure. And it will not only uh, bless you, but it'll pour out onto others. Uh, we're told that in Luke, in Luke's gospel, Luke 6, 38, that if you give of yourself, that God will pour onto you a measure, shaken down, pressed together, and it'll spill over into your lap, and then it's going to get on other people. But that comes on the other side of obedience. Something really strange happens right after that, though. Simon comes back after all that, all that blessing and overwhelming catch of fish, he comes to Jesus and he goes, get away from me. I'm a sinful person. That's crazy, isn't it? But I want you to think about that for a minute. The kind of the same thing happened the one other time that Jesus is in a boat and he stops a storm. We're told that the disciples are are afraid of the storm, but terrified of Jesus. See, when we see the power and the holiness, especially the power over nature that Jesus has, when we see what Jesus can do in us with his power, that is frightening. It's frightening to us because we can't control it. We're not sure we're ready to be so blessed. What if we open the doors and do what Jesus wants us to do at Sandbridge and we get too big? What if there's too many kids here? And more of us have to volunteer. That's too scary. That's how we are. It's interesting. I read some commentary this week that I thought was fascinating by a man named Rudolf Otto. He was a German theologian uh, in the early uh, 1900s. And he introduces something that he calls, 
calls the numinous awe. And it's we are attracted to Jesus, we are attracted to God because of the love and the compassion and, and that magnetism that pulls us in. But then at the same time, we're repelled by God because it terrifies us. You think about a person who's really, really attractive or really successful, and we want to migrate to that person, but then we also kind of don't like that person, and we'll start gossiping about them and push them away. Why? Because being around them makes us feel bad about ourselves. That's what happens, and that's what happened to Peter here. Same thing with God. We get in the presence and the power of God, and we realize how weak and how small and how sinful we are in comparison, and that frightens us. And so we want to be with God, but we push God away at the same time. And that's exactly what Simon does right here. He says, get away from me because I'm a sinful man. In comparison to God, in comparison to Jesus' power and what Jesus could do, Jesus, could, who wasn't a fisherman, could get this overwhelming catch of fish after Simon had tried to do that, the professional fisherman, all night and didn't catch a thing. And it makes him feel bad about himself. And so he said, it's not comfortable to be with Jesus. And that's what he tries. And that's really terrifying to us. You know, there's something about God that is threatening. There's something about God that we can't stand up to. We can't even stand to be in the presence. Moses went on the hill on the mountain. It was with God's presence in a cloud, and his hair turned stark white. Jacob is wrestling with God in the desert, and God's just playing with him. And then Jake, the night's coming to a close, and, and Jacob says it. That, that God, uh, this, thing, this creature that he thinks was God, just touched him on the hip, probably shattered his hip, debilitated him for life, the power of God. It scares us. Humanity and the sinfulness of humanity, when we get face to face with the righteousness and the holiness of God, we want, we're going to melt. We're going to melt, thought of legend. We can't handle it. And so we push God away. And Jesus says, I love this, he says to Simon, fear not, don't be afraid. There's a reason. that you know that that, word, that phrase, fear not, is in the Bible 365 times? Once for every day. Because every single day of our lives, we're going to be afraid of God. Because God is and can do what we cannot and who we are not. And that scares us. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. I'm going to do something with you. I'm going to make you more than you ever imagined, beyond your imagination. I'm going to make you fish for people. Apart from me, John 15 says, you can do nothing, but with me, you can do everything. So stick with me. Walk with me. Powerful. And so Peter left and dropped his nets and followed Jesus. Why? Because Jesus said so. What about us, my friends? I want us to think about that. How are you walking with Jesus? Because there's two different ways of walking with Jesus. If you walk with Jesus and he's your advisor and you read the Bible and you listen to the sermons and you hear the blog, you, you see the blogs and all that kind of stuff and then you take all of that under advisement and then you make your own decision, that's religion, that's ritual, that's good advice from a smart guy who is just an advisor. That's not walking with Jesus. That's saying, Jesus, you walk with me, I'm in charge. If you want to really walk with Jesus, that means allowing him to be Savior and Lord. That means obeying him, following his instructions, doing things his way, even when it's scary and the timing isn't right and it's overwhelming and it takes you out of your comfort zone. That's exactly when you need to really press in, in obedience and walk with Jesus and do what Jesus says just because he said so. You know, if you think about Simon Peter, uh, he wasn't perfect after this. He messed up a lot. He denied Jesus three times right, at, right after the crucifixion. He said stupid stuff to Jesus. He did, we're going to talk next week. He just did some crazy things. But S Simon Peter, in the power of Jesus, the first time Simon Peter preached, 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ. 3,000 people stepped into eternity. My friends, we are here today walking in eternity, whether we realize it or not. We are here because Simon Peter pushed out into deep water and obeyed Jesus simply because Jesus said so. I believe that God is calling all of us. I believe God is calling Sandbridge Community Chapel into deep water. 
We've been working hard to be people of God and to be a church of God and to make a difference in the world. But maybe it's time for us to surrender completely. Maybe it's time for us to lay down all we are and all we have and just go with Jesus into deep water and allow him to bring us a new and maybe even an overwhelming catch. Our job, my friends, as individuals and as a church, is to go and make disciples. Go and make your friends, your family, your co-worker, your neighbors, the vacationers you meet on the beach. Go and make them people of the kingdom of God. And we cannot do that on our own. We can only do that in the power of God, and we can only do that as we walk with him. But walking with him means letting him be Lord. It means surrendering to him. Do you want to walk with Jesus? Do you want to experience the overwhelming blessing that Jesus has in store for you? Do you want to experience God using you in overwhelming ways to touch and change lives for eternity? It's extraordinary what God might do if we do the extraordinary thing and surrender to him. Walk with Jesus. Follow his instructions. Put out into deep water just because he said so. Let's pray. Holy God, sometimes following you and walking with you is scary. It takes us into deep water, uncharted territory, things that are out of our control, and yet that's where the blessing is. So Lord, we ask this day that you would silence our fears, that silence our selfishness, Help us to surrender to you, to trust you, to move into deep water with you, and to say, Lord, we're going to do it just because you said so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.